Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Baruch College, and welcome particularly to the Lillian Nathan Ackerman Lecture in Race and Social Justice. My name is David Birdsell. I'm Executive Director of Academic Programs in the School of Public Affairs, and I bring you welcome from the Dean and the faculty of the school as we celebrate one of the most important events that we hold every year, uh, which is a discussion of the issues always embodied by a distinguished speaker, and this year Ken Pruitt, who will receive a more elaborate introduction from our Ackerman Chair, Nancy Foner, in just a few minutes that motivate the Ackerman bequest. The questions of race, the questions of justice, the questions of the immigrant experience in the United States, and how we deal with those issues, how we make sense of them in terms of policy, how we make sense of them as a people. Lily and Nathan Ackerman were immigrants to this country. Uh, they experienced the enormous expectations of immigrant life, the frustrations, and of course the joys and satisfactions of merging with the culture of a new country and experiencing and enriching that culture in their part. Through the generosity of Roslyn and Erwin Engelman, all of us can come to know something of that legacy and over the course of the last four years have heard a great deal from a number of very interesting speakers who have been provocative, who have been challenging, who have helped us to understand better the world that we live in and to understand how that world will change in the very near future. Representing the Engelmans this evening is Marion Engelman Lotto, who has in many ways done a tremendous amount to live the ideals of Lillian Nathan Ackerman. She is presently general counsel for New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, a firm that uh, has an in-house litigation practice that uh, deals with some of the major pressing questions of social justice in the United States today, but that also helps nonprofit organizations, myriad organizations throughout New York City particularly, to come to terms with a legal environment that's often beyond their means financially and beyond their ken in terms of knowledge. Um, very happy to have Marion here this evening to introduce the program and say a little bit more uh, about the Lillian Nathan Ackerman series. Thank you, David. On behalf of the Engelman family, I want to thank Dean Altman and David Birdsell for your support for the Anchor Ackerman Lecture Series and the focus on issues of justice and equality here at the School of Public Affairs. I also want to thank Nancy Foner, there you are, um, the current Ackerman Chair and tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Kenneth Pruitt. Um, before I say anything else, let me recognize the members of my family, uh, my parents, Rosalyn and Erwin Engelman, who are sitting in the front, and our extended family who has joined us here tonight. As many of you um, are already aware, this lecture series was named after my grandparents, Nathan and Lily Ackerman. The thought was, in part, that our current understanding of social divisions in this country and issues of injustice benefit from study from thought and from discussion. That through an understanding of our history collectively in its political, economic, and social context, we achieve a richer appreciation for how to address today's pressing social divisions. And so too in our family, we draw upon the stories of those who came before us for a deeper understanding of how to address these issues, of who we are, and of our aspirations. I only want to say a few words but allow me to tell one quick story about my grandmother. When I taught here at the school, I asked the students in my undergraduate class to write an essay on the first day of class describing when or how their family first came to this country, if they knew, and if they knew why their family first came to this country and the significance of that story to their own expectations for this country and to what it meant to be part of the United States. Many of the students wrote about how their parents sought to escape religious persecution or racial persecution, or how their parents or they themselves or their grandparents simply wanted a better life. Well, my grandmother's father, too, had come to the United States. Like many immigrants, he sent money back to my grandmother and her mother so that they could join him here in New York. After an arduous journey, my grandmother and her mother arrived from Russia to Warsaw. They were waiting for their visas, which took, as it does now, a long time, when they found out that a relative had died and that five cousins, now orphans, living back in Russia, in Novogradic, were orphaned and there alone. My grandmother, who was only a teenager who had just escaped from Russia, went by herself on a train back to Russia, 
without the proper papers, but with a lot of fear. While she was in Russia, her mother was called. They had the visas. But she couldn't go by herself because she couldn't read and she couldn't sign the documents. And it was only my grandmother who could finalize the papers. So when my grandmother came back, they had to wait additional months before getting their visas and leaving for America. Well, the cousins that my grandmother went to retrieve made it to Warsaw. And my grandmother and her mother traded in their first class tickets so that their cousins might be able to come to this country on the boat as well. As she wrote, she and her mother wound up lying very sick on the bottom of the ship Rotterdam. And I did not say the good ship Rotterdam. These were people who can and still will do anything to come to the United States. They believed, and today people like them believe in this country, is in this country as the land of freedom of, and opportunity. It is our mission, though, through these lectures, through our study, and through our lives, to try to perfect this vision and these ideas, to achieve meaningful equality and justice for all. On a more personal note, as a civil rights attorney, tonight's topic is of particular interest. My work as a civil rights attorney rests on the availability of racial data. And I know across this country that this issue is very timely with attacks on the collection of and recognition of any racial data by folks like Ward Connerly out in California. There's a range of opinions and a range of issues raised, and I very much look forward to tonight's topic. On behalf of the Engelman family, welcome. I look forward to hearing tonight's lecture. Thank you, Marion. The Ackerman Bequest not only funds and presents programs such as tonight's Ackerman Lecture, it also provides for a scholar in residence, uh, herself very distinguished and the second person to occupy the chair. Nancy Foner asked me to introduce her tonight by saying, next Nancy Foner. Uh, but that doesn't seem to me to be quite sufficient. Um, I won't go through and embarrass her through a litany of the many books that she has written, particularly on immigration policy that have become standards in the field. Um, I won't talk about the extent to which she has helped to shape the debate about immigration in this country and, in fact, throughout the hemisphere. I won't talk to you about her honorary degrees, about those degrees that she has earned or the other accolades, grants, and awards that have made her one of the nation's leading immigration scholars and one of the most recognized recognizable American voices on immigration throughout the planet. I won't tell you any of that. I'll just say, here's Nancy Foner to introduce Kenneth kind of Pruitt. Well, thank you very much for that unexpected. Now, now my uh, pleasure is to introduce um, our speaker tonight, Dr. Kenneth Pruitt. And I'm very honored that he has come and agreed to give the Ackerman Lecture this evening. Kenneth Pruitt has had an enormously impressive and distinguished career. And in fact, it would be practically a talk in itself to list all of his accomplishments. But let me just mention some of the highlights. Uh, Dr. Pruitt is currently the Carnegie Professor of Public Affairs at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Before this, he was the dean of the graduate faculty at the New School. And from 1998 until 2001, he was director of the US Census Bureau, where his primary focus was on the operations of Census 2000, with a budget of $7.5 billion and a part-time staff that at its peak was more than 900,000 persons. Prior to heading the, uh, the Census Bureau, uh, Dr. Pruitt was president of the Social Science Research Council, senior vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation, director of the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, and professor at various universities in the United States and abroad. He's written or co-written more than a dozen books, received numerous awards, and is a fellow of various bodies, including the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Kenneth Pruitt is one of America's most eminent scholars, and we will hear him speak this evening on a topic that draws on his experience as a social scientist and as a leading figure in government service. And the talk is titled, Why and How Does the U.S. Census Count Races? So, Kenneth Pruitt. Um, I'm truly um, complimented to, to speak tonight uh, in, um, in the Ackerman series. Um, and indeed, my thoughts uh, go right to the heart of what I think the, uh, the bequest was about and the, uh, the issues that the family still very much wants to keep prominent. Um, indeed, um, 
my thinking has actually evolved a bit since Nancy called me some time ago. And if I were titling the lecture today, I would slightly uh, change the title. Uh, and let me share that with you as a way to sort of set the stage. I would title it Ethno-Racial Classification. And does it have a future in American politics? And I think that's a very serious question for the issues of racial justice and inequality. Uh, but let's start at the beginning, uh, in, um, which means with the founders, in this case, uh, James Madison. Uh, James Madison was getting ready for the first decennial census, and he proposed a question on occupation. This occupational question would have classified the working population into agriculture, commerce, and manufacturing. The Senate rebuffed Madison's initiative and registered both a technical and a philosophical objection. Technically, said the congressional opponents, the categories were imprecise because, after all, the same person could fall into all three categories. He could be a farmer who manufactured nails on the side and then traded those nails with a neighboring farmer who made ax handles. More philosophically, Madison's critics held that an occupational classification would admit to and perhaps even excite differing economic interest. This very possibility challenged 18th century uh, political theory, which took society to be a harmonious whole and viewed the task of governing as divining the common good rather than managing conflicting interest. But of course, the 1790 census did differentiate the population. It obviously sorted residents geographically so as to allow for the apportionment of the House seats as promised in the Constitution. Indeed, from the beginning, and we will come back to this theme, the principle of proportionality that is proportionate to population size was embedded in the nation's theory of democracy. But geography was not the only classification in 1790. The population was divided into men and women, children and adults, and, of course, the civil status, status of slave and free. These classifications were directed to knowing the size of the population group that mattered. Adult white males, that is, those persons eligible to own property, pay taxes, to vote and hold office, and to serve in the military. My first point, obviously, obvious point, is Congress raised no objection to the separate counting of the free and the slaves. That is, to sorting by civil status, which, of course, was also a racial classification. The harmonious whole that was blind to occupational differences was not colorblind. There were Europeans, there were Native Indians, and there were Africans. In the color-coded language that becomes prominent in the 19th century, there were white, reds, and blacks. Indeed, let us skip now all the way to the 2000 census and ask, what remains from the 1790 census? What is new? but also what is different, or at least identify those changes that are germane to tonight's topic. On the nothing has changed side of the ledger, we start with two observations. The census, or more broadly official statistics, is still an exercise in making the society legible to the policymaking process, i.e. they needed to count the white male adults to make public policy. And the census today is still an exercise in making the society legible. And 210 years later, race is still central to making the society legible. So we still have a race question. Now, on the much has changed side of the ledger, also two observations. Statistics have been democratized in two important respects over these two centuries. First, statistical descriptions are as likely to be used by the electorate and interest groups to make the government legible, especially its policy failures, as they are to be used by the government to make the society legible or tractable to policy interventions. Secondly, statistical categories, especially for our purposes tonight, ethnic and racial categories, are no longer imposed by some distant bureaucracy, but are vigorously contested. Both of these changes are central to the argument of this lecture, so let me step back and frame them more carefully. Why take a census in the first place? We owe to Jim Scott the very nice formulation that official statistics are par part of the modern state-building apparatus that renders the society legible to the state. We might reason by analogy to map-making. 
which makes the physical features of a territory, and especially its relevant boundaries, legible to those who would exploit its resources and guard its frontiers. Census taking makes the social features legible, especially in early censuses, to learn where the wealth was and how it could be taxed. Indeed, the archaic uh, definition of a census is poll tax. Uh, the term itself dates to ancient Rome, but of course, census taking predates Roman times. Indeed, if you go back to the Old Testament, the fourth book of the Hebrew Bible is, after all, called Numbers. And in Numbers, Yahweh instructs Moses as follows. Take ye the sum of all of the congregation of the children of Israel, after their families, with the number of their names, every male from 20 years old and upward. That is, said the Yahweh, take a census of those able to go forth to war. It is quite probable that taxation or military conscription or both gave rise to all the censuses in ancient times. Now, given these very ambitious tasks assigned to census taking throughout history, the constitutionally required census in early American history actually had more modest aims. It was designed first as a count, but this simple count was a brilliant piece of political engineering. It solved two key nation-building tasks. It based political representation on the principle of territory and then allowed power to be regularly and fairly redistributed as the population grew at different rates from one state to another. Secondly, and sometimes overlooked, it allowed the new republic to avoid the dangers of empire. I pause on that word today. Uh, but at least in 1790, uh, it was the spirit that the Americans should resist uh, empire. At issue in this uh, argument is the prospective political status of Americans who lived outside the boundaries of the original 13 states. And these numbers were certain to grow in size as the resource-rich Western territories were opened up. The question facing the framers was, should these new territories be annexed as colonies or allowed to join the Union on equal footing with the, early, with the original 13 states? Very major question. The answer, of course, was equal statehood. As soon as a territory was sufficiently populated, the decennial census tracked the westward migration and regulated the pace at which territories could apply for statehood. Now, I only touch lightly on these issues, for our immediate purpose is to note that the census, or more broadly, systematic data collection and record keeping of the modern nation state, can be understood as an administrative instrument to maintain an up-to-date picture of whatever dimension of the population is thought necessary for effective governing. Now, any form of government has that as its task. In democratic societies, we want to add an argument. In democratic societies, the government is supposed to give reasons for its policies. From this perspective, information does more than make the society legible. A democratic government, obliged to give reasons for its policies, locates those reasons in the circumstances that give rise to the need for the policy response in the first place. Here we note something quite important about policymaking in a democracy. You're obligated to offer reasons for what is done and this unfolds in the context of the government's need to inquire. This is why we give to Congress the power to hold hearings and to investigate. It also underpins the massive data collection, record-keeping efforts uh, generated by our federal government and our state and local governments, of which the census is the largest and the most visible. But I want to continue with these musings for a moment. If we only thought about information collecting from the point of view of making the society legible to the government, we would miss something very important. Indeed, and this is the argument about the democratization of statistical data collection. A transformation took place in the latter part of the 19th century, and it underscores that legibility is a two-way street, at least in a democracy. We can only skim the surface of this rather large, fascinating topic but just a few illustrative points. Consider electoral accountability, uh, which holds that competitive elections offer to the electorate alternative portrayals of how well the government in power has performed or will perform against future challenges. This simple model presumes that the voters have information on which to assess governmental performance. Statistical trends often constitute this information. Is the economy growing or stagnating? 
Are education or health or housing conditions improving? Is the crime rate up or down? Are water and air clearer and cleaner than they were? Is there a missile gap? Back and forth claims about who can take credit for improvements or should be blamed for failure are the common currency of competitive elections and are advanced often by citing trend lines. Or can we reflect on, we can reflect on agenda setting, another staple of a political scientist, who asks how do social conditions become visible, especially those conditions which matter most to the unorganized and the disenfranchised? How did child labor or unsafe working conditions or male-female wage differential, differentials become politically salient? A common route is reform advocacy that takes as its starting point statistical profiles. Indeed, since the poverty surveys in Victoria and England, reform activists have mobilized political participation and informed public debate by transforming previously ignored social conditions into highly visible social injustices, poverty, prison conditions, racial discrimination, which we will obviously return, obviously return to. Advocates for resource-poor groups find in state-provided statistical information a way to compensate for the absence of such political resources as money, access, and organization. Indeed, since the pioneering work of the late 19th century social reformers, indicators, report cards, performance measures, and the like have become integral to social reform efforts, and of course have now become part of what governments feel obligated to supply to the population, at least in most democratic nations. Indeed, where governments are not inclined in this direction, international NGOs and various self-appointed watchdog groups, even the United Nations itself, oblige corruption indices, counts of human rights violations, human development ratings, and so forth. I want to rush past this point because it sets the stage. But I simply want to underline that if in a market economy, information directs both capital investment and consumer choices, in a democratic polity, it also has two tasks. It instructs policymaking, but it also provides the basis for informed citizen choices. Indeed, we might go so far as to distinguish an autocracy from a democracy by suggesting that in the latter, information asymmetry is impermissible. The people should know as much about their government as the government knows about them. Information collected from and about the population with proper confidentiality protections must be publicly available. Now, I started by asking what remains the same and what differs in the most recent relative to the earliest census. And I've now argued that the census remains an exercise in making the society legible so that the government can act on the basis of information and give reasons for its action. But the scope has broadened considerably. And what has changed is that political actors outside of government use government-provided statistical information to advance policy interest and to hold the electorate accountable for policy failures. The dual nature of publicly provided information in a democracy is illustrated in a very complex way by the changing fortunes of racial classification in American political history, and that's the topic to which we turn, which is to say we now move from why have a census to why does the census embed a racial classification. Earlier, I suggested that racial classification plays a central role in American politics and has since 1790. But this observation is such a high level of abstraction as to be meaningless. What I want to argue is that the policy uses to which racial classification have been put have been now radically redirected and I think are in the process of being redirected once again. The reasons for racial classification in 1790 census are well known. One of the several compromises necessary to convince slave-owning states to ratify the Constitution was to include slaves in the census counts that allocated seats in the House of Representatives. As most of you know, it was a partial count because each slave was assigned a weight of 0.6 that was counted as three-fifths of a person. But it was sufficient to reward the South with more congressional seats than a count limited to its white population would have provided. This was one of the nasty compromises that led to the acceptance of the Constitution by the South. And indeed, among other things, elected Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson would not have been elected without the slave power bonus, as it's called by the historians. Indeed, the South gets an enormous bonus after the Civil War 
when now African Americans are counted as full persons, but of course are denied access to the ballot box. So from 1790 to 1960, we have created a fundamental disproportionate allocation of power by the way in which we counted uh, the black population in American society. We take from the 1790 census another lesson. To divide the population into its several race groups was unquestioned, an assumption that was not seriously challenged for nearly two centuries. The categories shifted around across the 19th century as prevailing policy needs or different scientific thought took hold. In 1820, the census added free colored persons to the census form. After the Civil War, interest in shades of color led the census to classify people as mulatto, quadroon, and octoroon. Asians began to appear in the census categories around the same time. Chinese and Japanese, reflecting a longstanding confusion between race and nationality, were counted in 1890. Filipinos, Koreans, and Hindus, here confusing a religion with a race, appeared on the census form in 1920. Until 1930, Amer Mexicans were counted as white, but then in 1930 were separately counted as a race, only to be quickly dropped when the government of Me Mexico complained. Hawaiian and part Hawaiian appear in the 1960 form, of course, as, as also do uh, the Eskimo, the Alaskan populations. Hispanic origin appears in 1980 and in ever, every sense of sense, though treated as an ethnic rather than a racial category. The point is it was always there, but it got changed depending upon prevailing policy needs and, and scientific thought. This condensed history, of course, ignores um, race science as well as the often nasty politics of racial exclusion, but allows us to make a general point. From 1790 until very recently, American politics incorporated two basic premises about racial classification in its system. First, there are a fixed number of discrete categories, and everyone fits into one and only one of those categories. Second, a racial classification even if its details vary from one decade to the next, is basic to making the society legible to policymaking. It frames our discussion to remind ourselves of the contours of policy history that have been based on racial classification. The backdrop to this narrative is the way in which 19th century imperialism and immigration combined to transform the nation's racial demography. Uh, Jefferson's great land purpose, being celebrated even this week, added Creoles to our basic population. The pur purchase of the Russian colony of Alaska in 1867 added the in Inuit, Kodiak, and other Alaskan natives. The Mexican-American War in mid-century added the nation's first large Mexican population. Spanish-American War later in the century added Puerto Rico, other Caribbean islands and their people, as well as Guam and the Philippines. When Hawaii was annexed in 1898, its native Pacific Islander population fell under American rule. Although population increases that resulted from conquest and purchase were relatively small, they added substantially to the country's racial diversity. Indeed, the 19th century completed the racial pentagon. It added brown and yellow to the 18th century population base of white, black, and red. Of course, the 19th and early 20th century immigration story is less about race than about national origin and religion though these ra traits were often racialized, as in the swarthy Southern Europeans or the Jewish race. The well-known story is how a permissive immigration policy that brought workers to a growing economy was combined with civic exclusion, denial of citizenship, and limited rights. Indeed, state-sanctioned discrimination is the central racial narrative until the 1960s, when the Civil Rights Revolution is truly revolutionary. This revolution did not challenge the basic political premise that racial classification is necessary for policymaking, but it, of course, radically redirected how the classification is to be used. And it radically changed the locus of political battles about the construction of racial categories. We start with the obvious point. The civil rights laws reversed the historic uses to which racial classification had been put. Where earlier policies have been discriminatory, new policies would right those wrongs, would now benefit those groups historically discrim discrim discriminated against. 
belonging to a racial minority becomes a basis from which to assert a civil right. In this task, statistical proportionality became the favorite legal and administrative tool. The civil rights movement did not initially have statistical proportionality in mind. Indeed, it promised the end of social policy based on racial groups. The new policy and law were to be colorblind, but a colorblind society did not blossom. Discrimination did not give way. Soon the nation was enmeshed in a new form of politics. Equal opportunity became proportional representation. Who is underrepresented? Discrimination became statistically detected. Disparate impact gains an important place in legal reasoning. Institutional racism enters the political vocabulary and individual rights come to share political space with group rights. Accompanying this shift in vocabulary and focus was a broadened understanding of civil rights, which, which was quickly adjudged to be about more than redressing the legacy of slavery. It became about all groups historically discriminated against, especially, of course, Native Indians, Hispanics, and Asians. Civil rights became minority rights, and references to black-white were supplanted with references to people of color. Quickly, even this was too narrow a construction, because people of color did not encompass all groups historically discriminated against, in particular, the women and the disabled. Now, statistical proportionality was central to the steady broadening of the civil rights agenda. How do we know if a society is just? We ask, what groups are underrepresented in colleges and universities, in the better jobs, in winning government contracts, in home mortgages, in elected offices? When the underrepresented are racial minorities, racial discrimination is indicated. And four groups were officially designated as protected groups, African Americans, Asians, Hispanics, and Native Indians. But the expansion of civil rights was not yet finished. Discrimination is discrimination, whether it has historical roots or not. Social justice should be available to any persons whose ascribed characteristics deny them access to education, health care, employment, or bank loans. It is at this point, of course, that claims by recent immigrants enter the picture. Sikhs, Ecuadorians, Tunisians could not, of course, have suffered from historic discrimination prior to the 1960s, they weren't here. But if they are targets of discrimination today, and some certainly are, they have claimed the protections and benefits promised by the civil rights policies. The census racial classification that gave rise to statistical proportionality as a juridical and administrative tool had a small number of discrete categories, white, black, Indian, to which was added Asian, and then Hispanic. That has now changed. So let's shift and ask, what began to take place in the politics of the racial taxonomy? When a classification system, such as the racial classification system, accumulated more and more policy weight, the categories themselves could hardly be left to chance and there has emerged what would, we could call a politics of classification, of what groups are going to be identified. And it itself drew fresh energy from the rise of multicultural identity politics. These politics brought many advocacy groups to issues that, general, that generally had been the preserve of statistical agencies. Indeed, it is one of my central points that the politics of ethno-racial classification will become more prominent in the next few decades both in the United States and across Europe. Fueling these politics is a very broad public question. Why do we have an official ethno-racial classification? Now, as I've said, early in America's history, the answer was clear. The classification made the society legible in a manner that buttressed discriminatory and exclusionist social policies. Even as these policies were radically altered, the clarity remained. In the wake of the 1960s, it was historical wrongs and ongoing discrimination that had to be rendered legible. 
This clarity has faded in response to two recent developments, immigration and multiracialism. Talk first about immigration. The late 20th century immigration surge is too well known to require more than a few comments to bring it to mind, initiated in the 1960s by a shift in immigration policy criteria that rejected national origin quotas established earlier in the century and in introduced new criteria, family re reunification, political refugee status, and skill-based criteria. These criteria, as we know, led to massive shifts in the regions of the world sending immigrants to the United States, Asians and Latinos arrived in large numbers. Uh, and these patterns, of course, show no signs of reversal. Fundamentally, the native European Protestant stock that colonized the country has disappeared completely from our immigration flows. There are, of course, deep demographic constants at work here uh, associated with below replacement fertility across all the OECD countries, also in the United States, which set in, in movement um, vast population uh, movement, um, set in motion these movements. Um, just quickly, under current uh, UN projections in the next half century, Italy's population will drop from 57 million to 41 million, Russian Federation from 47, uh, 147 to 121. Similar patterns hold in the advanced economies of East Asia. Of course, the poor regions of the world yet to complete their demographic transition are Africa, the Middle East, Central and Southeast Asia, and parts of Latin America. To state the obvious, the migratory flows that are now set loose in the world will bring immigrants to host countries who are racially, culturally, linguistically, and ethnically and religiously unlike the populations of the receiving countries. The much remarked upon diversity in the United States is a direct reflection of these demographic trends. Immigration plus higher than replacement fertility among the foreign board added nearly 33 million residents between 1990 and 2000, with especially high levels of growth among the working age population. The self-evident point is that ethno-racial categories that were devised for a very different population, the old racial pentagon of white, black, red, yellow, and brown, having a hard time adjusting to the changing demography that results from this recent immigrant flow. Scholars are trying to sort out now including people, of course, like Nancy Foner, whether the new immigrant groups want to be separately counted so as to separately matter, or will they want to blur the boundaries as the earlier Irish and Italian immigrants did, of course. Of interest in this regard is the large number of immigrants who chose white as their racial identity in the 2000 census. Of the 28 million foreign-born counted, two-thirds said they were white, a significant increase over 1990 when only half the foreign-born population checked white as their race. White will perhaps become the catch-all category for the new immigrants, being treated as a synonym for opportunity and inclusion, as it was for Southern and Eastern Europeans a century ago, rather than really as a racial characteristics. Or we can get an increase in the number of hyphenated groups that try to step outside the racial taxonomy altogether. This strategy echoes what the American Jews did in the first part of the 20th century, when Jewish American, as a hyphenated identity, allowed them to both retain their culture but claim an American status which was not black. Indeed, insisting on being both Jewish and American, they resisted attempts to insert Jewishness as a separate racial category into the racial classification system. The point is there's now an active self-conscious politics of sorting and classifying led by those groups which historically were the unwilling subjects of imposed taxonomies. The Census Bureau, for example, has five active race and ethnic ethnic advisory committees, representing groups historically discri discriminated against, African Americans, Asians, Hispanics, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and Native Indians. Will the new immigrant groups from the Middle East, or Central Asia, or Islamic Africa, find their way into this pre-existing structure, or will they argue for their own committees? If the latter, how many such committees? Unlike their predecessors in the 19th century, Today's immigrants, or at least their advocacy organizations, take for granted that categories will not be determined by some distant government agency, but will result from advocacy and agitation. The resulting political ferment is one of the major factors destabilizing the present classification system. Now let me turn to the second destabilizing force, and that, of course, 
is a long-delayed recognition of multiracialism. Protecting the purity of the white race by outlawing miscegenation never controlled sexual behavior to the degree its proponents hoped. Loving versus Virginia, 1967, finally ally aligned the law with practices that, of course, date to the arrival of the Europeans in the New World. It was simply a matter of time before statistical measurement would adjust. As recently as 1990, every resident in America, according to the census, was one of two ethnic groups, Hispanic or non-Hispanic, and one of four primary racial groups, white, black, Negro, Native Indian, Native Alaska, and Asian. There was also a residual other category. A number of things happened to this tidy classification in the census of 2000 each of which illustrates the current flux in ethno-racial classification. Starting with the Hispanic population, spokespersons for, the America, for America's Hispanic population have insisted they speak for an ethnic and not a racial group. The Hispanic population itself is less certain of this. Indeed, in 2000, more than two in five of the Hispanics chose the residual other category in the census form and wrote in Hispanic our related term. By this measure, there are 15 million persons of Hispanic descent who challenge the government's position that Hispanic is an ethnic and not a racial description. They, in effect, are saying there is a brown race and there are 15 million of us who belong to it. Secondly, in the 2000 census, the four primary racial categories that have been used in 1990 became five. Uh, responding to political pressure, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders were separated from the Asian category. They'd been there in 1990, but for 2000, uh, they were made their own category. This change might appear insignificant, but I stress it because it's indicative that the classification is now a moving target. And as noted in more detail below, will expand whenever sufficient pressure is brought to bear. The more far-reaching change in since the 2000 was, of course, the multiple race option. A person can be two or more of the primary racial categories. Mark one or more converts six categories, that is the five primary, now including Native Pacific Islander as one of the five primary, and the other line converts the six categories into 63 categories, which, of course, when cross-tabulated by the ethnic, non-ethnic I mean, Hispanic, non-Hispanic ethnic category produces 126 racial ethnic categories. What for 200 years had been racial, class, racial classification based on a small number of discrete groupings is no more. This happened because Americans who view themselves as being of more than one racial heritage, along with couples of mixed race marriage with multiple race children, argued that being forced to choose only one race was discriminatory. 200 years ago, the Senate held that Madison's proposed three-part occupational taxonomy for the census was arbitrary because people can be farmers and manufacturers and tradesmen. Mark one or more did not occur to them as a solution. Today, with respect to race, it did occur. The multiple race option was not heavily used in 2000 of the 281 Americans counted. 6.8 million, 2.5%, reported themselves as being of two or more races. And agencies that enforced non-discriminatory laws and race-based public policies accommodated the expanding number of racial categories by devising collapsing rules, and there was no major disruption in political administrative conditions. I believe that the short-term public and political response to the multiple, multiple race option does not adequately predict what is in store. Self-identification as multiracial will increase, partly as a result of social legitimation, especially among the young, but also resulting from increasing rates, of course, of marriage across racial lines. Beyond this, there will be continuing pressure to expand the number of primary groups in the classification system. In the mid-1990s, when changes in racial me measurement were under consideration, groups other than those eventually recognized were demanding to be separately identified. There were, for example, groups urging that the white category be disaggregated. The Celtic Coalition, the National European American Society, the Society for German American Studies, all argued that white was too crude a category. There was also a very active effort by Arab Americans 
to reclassify persons of Middle Eastern origin from white to an, Ar to an Arab American or Middle Eastern category. Though lamentably, lamentably uh, the 9-11, uh, of course, has muted this demand. Over time, it will be difficult to resist pressures to expand the current categories. On what grounds does the federal government declare that enough is enough? To have gradually moved from three to four to five and then to 63 separately major groups is to acknowledge that there is no natural limit. Adding even one more primary group would take the 63 to 127, which when cross-tabulated by Hispanic, non-Hispanic, generates 254 race ethnic categories. If, as is logical, the Hispanic, non-Hispanic category should also allow for Mark one or more. I mean, obviously, I can have an Hispanic uh, mother and a non-Hispanic father. So you, add a, you now will triple whatever the primary categories are, not just double them. Indeed, even if limited to 63, if you then triple them, Hispanic, mixed, and non-Hispanic, uh, and if you added even one more primary race, you would get to 762 discrete race and ethnic groups, with, of course, no end in sight. The pressures and counterpressures will play out against a growing scientific discomfort with any racial measurement. At present, administrative requirements and census taking override science when it comes to racial classification. As candidly stated by the Office of Management and Budget, um, these classifications should not be interpreted as being scientific or anthropological in nature. They have been developed in response to needs expressed by both the executive branch and Congress, which is to say they have been created to do what the census was designed to do, was to make the society legible the way the country wanted to make it legible. So this sentence would suggest. I will argue that the census, that sentence doesn't quite explain things. I suggested earlier that there was a clear and agreed upon answer to our basic question. Why do we classify by race and ethnicity? The purpose, to make the society legible in ways that facilitate public policy. For the last four decades, since the Civil Rights Movement, the public policies that have owned racial classification have, of course, been those associated with voting rights, affirmative action, and related social justice measures focused on redressing historical discrimination. That ownership is now being challenged. The advocates for the multiple race item and for expanding ethno-racial categories more generally start from a very different place. For them, the categories are not about making the society legible to the governing process. For them, the categories are about social identity. If this makes the classification less useful, or perhaps even useless, for race-sensitive policies, this is a price to pay for the right to be recognized for what one is. In 1997, congressional hearings were held about the multiple race item. The traditional civil rights organization stressed the responsibility of government to police discrimination. The new advocates for multiracial counting countered this by suggesting that to force them into a box that did not reflect their true identity was, deny, was to deny them their civil rights. For example, the NAACP. The aggregation of categories is not a mechanism to provide vehicles for self-identification. These categories are fashioned to enhance the enforcement of anti-discrimination and civil rights laws. The creation of the multi-race classification, according to the NAACP, might disaggregate the apparent numbers of members of discrete minority groups, diluting the benefits to which they are entitled as a protected class under civil rights laws and under the Constitution itself. In our quest for self-identification, they continue, we must take care not to recreate, reinforce, or even expand the caste system we are all trying so hard to overcome. A Latino voice argued along the same lines. While concerns regarding public acknowledgement and identity strike a responsive chord with the Latino community, we understand the purpose of the census is to both to enforce and implement the law and to inform lawmakers about the distinct needs of specially historically disadvantaged populations. But now listen to the language of those arguing on behalf of the multi-race item. We want choice in the matter. 
We want choice in the matter of who we are, just like any other community. We are not a solution to civil rights laws or civil rights injustices of the past. I find it ironic that our organization and our people, this is the Association of Multi-Ethnic Americans, I find it ironic that our organization and our people are being asked to correct by virtue of how we define ourselves all the past injustices of other groups of people. And a founder of another organization called Project Race. The reality is that not all Americans fit neatly into one little box. The reality is that multiracial children who wish to embrace all of their heritage should be allowed to do so. They should not be put in the position of denying one of their parents to satisfy arbitrary government requirements. Indeed, the arrival of the multiple race item uh, in the conversations in Washington, the fiscal agencies, occurred when the Census Bureau and OMB were flooded with photographs of five and six-year-olds, obviously multi-race, with the parents writing, you are forcing my son or my daughter, this lovely child, to choose between us. And it denies them their civil rights. It denies them their identity. The multiple race advocacy groups were echoing, echoing broader currents loosened by identity politics that ironically can in part be traced to the widespread use of statistical proportionality pressed by the traditional civil rights groups. The purpose of ethno-racial classification is no longer confirmed only by its use in informant in enforcement, which, re which requires a small number of discrete categories. A second purpose is to be served, choice, expression, identity. And this points to a proliferation of categories. As one scholar has asked, who would have expected that that stodgy data collection agency, the Census Bureau, would be a leading force for deconstruction? <laughs> now, the introduction of multi-race in official statistics is not the end of the story. And we turn briefly now to two other developments that greatly complicate the future of ethno-racial classification. One is indicated by the Racial Privacy Initiative in California, as was mentioned. This is a political effort to end all, F all official ethno-racial classifications. The second is the Diversity Initiative. Quickly on the Racial Privacy Initiative, if you don't know, uh, it essentially would uh, deny the, the right in, in the state of California to collect any race, ethnic, uh, national origin uh, data. Um, uh, it's still early to say, although they've got enough signatures to get it on the ballot, but it's early to say uh, exactly how that's going to play out. But it is indicative, it seems to me, of a much broader feeling in American society that uh, we want to get rid of all of these boxes and categories, uh, uh, period. The diversity initiative. Uh, further complicates our story. Indeed, I think the diversity of initiative, uh, initiative is uh, a really uh, seriously destabilizing uh, uh, force with respect to ethno-racial uh, classifications. Um, let me remind you that the civil rights story, as I rather quickly condensed it, first it's slavery, the legacy of slavery, black, white, then people of color, then all people historically discriminated against, then all people being discriminated against, then anyone who is underrepresented. And it seems to me the diversity language is the next national, is the next natural step in that continuum. Let me remind you how the word diversity is used in higher education. Uh, higher education uses the word with reference to groups historically discriminated against. That is, they hold on to the broad version of civil rights. But what is telling in higher education is that the language does not stop there. The diversity initiative is about much more than compensating for patterns of historic discrimination. In fact, across the country, colleges and universities claim they are diverse because they attract students from different economic backgrounds, from every state in the nation, and even better if from many foreign countries. Claims of diversity reference multiple religions on campus, various groups whose first language is not English, a noticeable proportion of the university diversity statements, and I've read a lot of them, take note of lifestyles and sexual orientation. Many move beyond demographic traits altogether. Um, 
and talk about the variety of intellectual uh, persuasions that can be found on campus. Let me cite just one um, university across the river, Rutgers. Diversity encompasses race, ethnicity, culture, social class, national origin, gender, age, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, mental ability, and physical ability. Even institutions self-divined by the absence of diversity on one or another dimension are eager to embrace it on other dimensions. Historically black college, uh, historically black college prides itself on a student body characterized by diversity, which it describes as having students from almost every state in America, but also from the West Indies, the Caribbean, Puerto Rico. A women's college offers that it is a multicultural community. Students come from all over the world, from different cultures and backgrounds, so of course it's not gender diverse. What is behind this insistence in university after university that it has a diverse student body? I emphasize that in part is to try to retain the affirmative action uh, programs that uh, the Powell, uh, the Powell, Powell, of course, introduced the word diversity in the Bakke uh, 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 case and was re-argued, of course, in the Michigan cases just two weeks ago. But once diversity was introduced into our logic, it also became a marketing tool. Study with us because we are diverse. It is this marketing language that explains why the term is so inclusive, where diversity is asserted because the campus has foreign students, draws from 50 states, welcomes gays and lesbians, provides worship facilities for every religion. If the legacy of discrimination and the marketing language exhausted the purposes attached to the diversity agenda, it would be less importance to our topic. I think something more far-reaching is at stake. Let a few institutions speak for themselves. At Harvard, diversity develops the kind of understanding that can only come when we are willing to test our ideas and arguments in the company of people with different perspectives. At Tufts, it makes study on the university campus more rewarding and productive at the University of Texas. It prepares educated, productive citizens who can meet the rigorous challenge of an increasingly diverse society. At Swarthmore, it allows students to experience one of the more treasured types of diversity, and so forth and so on. Taking these statements at face value, which I think we should, Higher education is articulating a new theory about what it takes to educate successfully. It is as if responsibility for pedagogy had been shifted from the curriculum committees to the missions office. The rhetoric across higher education implies that the failure to produce a diverse student body impairs the quality of education, and a persuasive case can be made. Before drawing out the implications of this for our topic, let me shift quickly to corporate America and see how the word diversity is used there. ExxonMobil tells us, by hiring people from diverse cultures and with diverse backgrounds and experiences, we gain essential local knowledge and the breadth of perspective necessary to gain, uh, to achieve our business objectives. At DuPont, when employees offer their own diverse insights and cultural sensitivities, they open new customer bases and market opportunities. At State Farm, diversity helps us understand the marketplace. Boeing is even more direct. We know that diversity gives us a competitive advantage. The rationale is what we would expect from corporate America. Uh, a, divine, a, a diverse workforce is appropriate to its profit-maximizing uh, responsibilities. What is diversity? Procter & Gamble. Our diversity covers the broad range of personal attributes and characteristics such as race, sex, age, cultural heritage, personal background, and sexual orientation. General Motors is no less expansive. We believe that diversity is the collective mixture of similarities and differences. This recognizes that diversity includes race and gender, as well as age, education level, family status, language, military status, physical abilities, religion, sexual orientation, union representation, and years of service. In corporate America, the rationale for diversity is narrowly focused on market competitiveness. But the definition of diversity is, uh, a, a, is as inclusive as is necessary. It implicitly suggests that if a business does not market, for example, to African Americans or any other subpopulation, it would not need to be included in its workforce. The diversity agenda for corporate America is not about undoing the legacy of slavery. It is not about the broad and minority rights agenda with its focus on all groups historically discriminated against. It's not about the underserved or underrepresented. It's not about discrimination. This argument is echoed in the military, some of whose leaders weighed in on behalf of the Michigan case, where the payoff was national security. 
the civil rights movement started with an ethical commitment. Civil rights movement was justified in terms of what this society had done to certain population groups. We now have shifted in a half century from that rationale to a highly instrumental rationale. In corporate America, it's to make money. In the military, it's national security. And in higher education, it's to educate better. These are instrumental justifications for the diversity initiative. Now, where is this all going? The diversity rationale can drive the classification system into finer and finer distinctions. A diversity matrix, given those sentences I just read, is orders of magnitude more complex than the original civil rights classification based on black-white. But it's also much more complex than the minority rights classification with its attention to people of color, women, and the disabled. Indeed, the civil rights classification is too high order to satisfy the logic of diversity. In the search for a diverse student body, workforce, military, or government agency, we might presumably require a measurement system that reflects the dozens, if not hundreds, of different cultures, language groups, and nationalities represented in the fresh immigrant stream. A university cannot claim that balanced diversity is achieved when 15% of the students are Hispanic if all of them are Cuban. All of the Asians cannot be Korean. Even whiteness has to be disaggregated to make sure there are Greeks and Argentines as well as Anglo-Saxons and Germans and so on and so on. And of course, you have to add all of the other categories. And logically, uh, diversity not, does not even have to stop the demographic categories. So one possibility is that the diversity logic, especially if legally protected, will push the measurement system toward more fine-grained distinctions capturing as much diversity as possible so that we will have a denominator against which to assess progress toward the diverse workforce, our student body. The counter possibility is that the system will collapse and take with it statistical proportionality, benchmarks, and counts of the underrepresented. We may get to the point, and the Supreme Court may help us get there, where though we can't specify diversity, you know it when you see it. Now, the other outcome is that the racial privacy initiative motivation may prevail. We may be full cycle back to the Senate rejection of Madison's occupational classification, except now the Supreme Court may rule, as I think they will rule if the privacy, I'm not saying how they will rule, I'm sure they will rule if the privacy initiative in California is passed, because it, be, it will be litigated. They may rule that racial categories are unconstitutional uh, 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 by imagining that against the 14th Amendment. So let me summarize. There are four political forces impinging now, make it narrow again. There are four political forces impinging upon the Census Bureau as it struggles uh, to think about racial measurement in 2010 and beyond. One is the obligation to protect a classification that allows the nation to make legible the lingering effects of a very long period of racial discrimination and to act as an early warning system of new versions of the same perhaps directed against recent immigrants. The second pressure is the more recent assertion that the right to express one's identity, however defined, is itself a civil right in the multicultural world we inhabit. The third force is public confusion and some discomfort with race and ethnic boxes altogether. This confusion we know to be widespread and to have been broadened by the multiple race option and we will get a clearer sense of the scope and depth of public discomfort as the campaign for and against the California Initiative gains momentum. The fourth political force is embedded in the practical, analytic, and legal ramifications of shifting to the rhetoric of diversity. All censuses classify as well as count. Classifications can be arrayed along a continuum. At one end of the continuum are classifications that emerge from a general scientific and public consensus about the objective of the categories in the classification. At the other end are those classifications where science is silent, where objectivity is doubted, and where consensus is elusive. In 1790, the US Census included a race question, a gender question, and an age question. 200 years later, we still have a gender and age question that is constructed almost exactly the way it was constructed in 1790. This is in marked contrast to the racial classification, which has been repeatedly modified and is today, I suggest, at a point of analytic confusion, scientific doubt, 
public debate and political instability. I have suggested that information is the dual task of making the society legible to the government and the government legible to the electorate. This leads to the consideration of how the governors and the governed contest the scope, the content, and the availability of information. No feature of the nation's number system is as likely to be as contested as our ethno-racial classification. And I am actually not certain that it has much of a future in our American public policy. Thank you. Nancy said that I could feel a few questions and she will make me stop when, uh, when it's time to stop. Please. Hello, thank you. I enjoy your talk very much. I was just hired by Baruch College to teach in sociology and black and Hispanic studies, so your talk is especially interesting. And one of the things I was told when I was being recruited for the job was that Baruch is the second most selective college in New York State after West Point, and then I was told with a smile that it was ranked as the most diverse college in the nation. And so it, this, is, this comes to home um, very much. Let me also say that you were once almost my boss, although you don't know that, because in 2000 I took the test to become an enumerator, and, and I, I didn't end up working in, in, the, um, in the census, but um, I, my question has to do with the counting of undocumented immigrants. And most people uh, often assume that if you're not documented, then you're not counted, but we know that the census is to count everybody who's physically present. Um, and I was being recruited to work on the census because I work with undocumented populations and I was going to help the enumerators. What do you think the success is counting the undocumented in the U.S. Census? historically, but specifically, most recently. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think it would have been better if you had come to work for us. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, actually, we think we did a fairly good job uh, uh, counting the undocumented, partly because of the really, really active involvement of this by the Catholic Church, um, uh, especially in the, in the Southwest. Uh, uh, they, they, they spent, and, and also advocacy groups for, for um, uh, migrant workers and so forth, worked very, very closely with the Census Bureau. The reason that we think that we did a fairly good job is that our final count was a big surprise to us, that is, to the Census Bureau, which is supposed to know about these kinds of things, a very big surprise by several millions of people. And uh, it's because the models that we have of the, uh, of the undocumented uh, presume a sort of rotation through the society. You come, you work a couple of years, and you go back out. We took the census, of course, at a, a, a point of really uh, very, very low unemployment, uh, a, a high degree of, of, um, of, of economic uh, well-being and, and growth in the society. And uh, we think the undocumented had simply not rotated back out. They'd come in, especially in Mexico, and not gone back. Uh, we suggest we happened to ca catch a moment when there was an unusually high number of them in the country, and our models didn't predict that, but we did find them in the, in the census. Uh, you never know for sure. We don't ask, of course, documentation. Um, uh, we, we, you would not get a count if you ask people if they're here illegally. So we don't ask that question. But we do estimate it based as, as well as we can. And I think the, the estimates are something like six to, somewhere between six and nine million. Please. Uh, yes, good evening. My name is Daniel Bowen. I'm a student here, freshman. Um, yes, you, uh, you say that diversity language is, a, is an issue of today and of tomorrow. Um, do, you, do you see a day coming in America where I don't have to check whether I, I'm a black or Hispanic or something like that, where we can just drop all the, the race, the racial issues all together and just see each other as male or female? Well, I, th uh, that's the big question. Uh, it's, it's a very big question. And um, uh, one would like that to happen because there is no discrimination there to detect to detect and to police uh, and to control. Um, one would like it to happen because we don't need to. What I'm concerned about, and we'll say so more bluntly now, is that carried to its conclusion, the diversity language will make it impossible to sustain the very measurement system that has allowed us to deal something about discrimination for the last 50 years. Um, and that uh, associated with, with 
the, the racial privacy initiative uh, people in California. This is coming out of a very conservative uh, group uh, who simply want to do away with race-based social policy. We would love to do away with race-based social policy. The question is, are we going to do away with race-based discrimination? Uh, and until we do away with, with, until that's gone, we can't do, it seems to me. Um, and uh, so I, it's a very, it's, it's it exactly the question. That's why I say I think this country is facing the tough question is why do we do it in the first place? And if we do it to police discrimination, we cannot proliferate these categories because it won't, it, the system just is not robust enough to do it. Sure. Uh, uh, one, one would like for us to get to the place where it's not necessary. Okay. Um, all right. We, we mentioned that um, the census is about getting the public policy of our Americans to, to have good governing. Now, um, that you mentioned affirmative action and whatnot with, with, uh, with the, all the things that African Americans have, have dealt with. Um, it, do you see reparations as being a serious public um, policy issue. I don't, the only presidential candidate that's actually brought this up seriously is like Al Sharpton and, and the media is yeah. down him uh, seriously, uh, greatly. Um, I actually think that affirmative action is, is a form of, of that policy, as a matter of fact. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, this country, uh, during, during the moment when indeed the new immigrants came, uh, after, after their discriminatory policies, after those were sort of lifted and we allowed anyone, at least if you were white and European, to get into the American economy and so forth. Um, my, my parents and many of the parents of the people in this, in this room and going all the way back to the Ackermans and so forth, um, they benefited enormously uh, with the economic growth of the 20th century. Uh, and the blacks didn't. Uh, the blacks uh, simply were not allowed into the same kind of educational institutions, same kind of job opportunities um, as, as, as the white European population was, even the immigrant population. And so in some sense, there's got to be a catch up. Uh, we are now in a situation where we're passing on what our parents uh, earned uh, to our children. And at exactly the moment when our parents were earning this money and passing it on to us and we're passing it on to our children, uh, the African-American population never had that opportunity to accumulate that asset base. And I think there has to be some way, and it seems to me that programs like Affirmative Action, Head Start programs, the way to create an asset base that will bring the African-American population and increasingly, of course, uh, the Mexican-American population, the, un the less well-educated American uh, Mexican-American population is going to be in the same situation. So I would, I would that, that is on reparations, I would say that, that an active investment by the society in education, uh, in, in job training, and so forth is the way to do it. Go ahead. Yeah, good evening, uh, Professor. Um, my question is uh, more for clarity. In regards to the beginning of your lecture, you mentioned about the uh, census in regards to the South as far as congressional seating. I don't know if that's done away with. Excuse me, maybe you can indulge my ignorance. <laughs> But some believe that this form or ideology is still taking place more in the New York area upstate in regards to the prison population census right. uh, for right. seating purposes. How would you address that, my yeah. question? Let me go back to the slave power argument. But this is an important question or an interesting question, certainly about, about the prison population. Um, and I'll get to that. The, the slave power, what actually happened is you had, a, you had a census which is supposed to count everyone, and on the basis of that count, don't count just voters, you don't count just citizens, you count everyone. On the basis of that count, you allocate congressional seats. And in the American South, from 1790 uh, to, uh, to the 14th Amendment, uh, the African Americans were counted as three-fifths of a person. Of course they didn't vote. Uh, of course, they didn't hold office, but they built up the size of the congressional representation in, um, in the South. Uh, and then, as I say, you got the bonus uh, afterwards until, until uh, the Civil Rights Movement. Now, uh, we actually, uh, hopefully, we're getting closer to a, a form of, of sort of fair representation. We still don't have completely fair representation, of course. Small states uh, are disproportionately powerful in American politics because they have two senators and they have electoral, uh, electoral college based on that. You're asking now a very subtle version of that same issue, which is to say, when the census counts the prison population in upstate New York, that small county in upstate New York 
now gets more congressional representation than New York City does, which is where the prison population from which it has been re relocated. Um, I'll give you one just anecdote on this. Um, uh, Tommy Thompson, who was then the governor of, um, of, of, of Wisconsin, uh, called during the census and said, uh, uh, Mr. Director, um, we arrest people in our state. We try them in our state. We convict them in our state. We then send them to Oklahoma where they're imprisoned. But when they're out, they're going to come back to our state. We want them counted in our state. <laughs> um, and uh, not, not in Oklahoma. Um, and I did respond to the good governor. I said, uh, yes, sir, we understand that. And uh, we're also thinking about counting all of those uh, students from Illinois who are now at the University of Wisconsin uh, uh, in, uh, in Illinois. Uh, well, no, 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 no. Um, so the, you're absolutely right. There are some, some distortions in the system because the census has to count people where they are. That's what the Constitution tells us to do. And, uh, and it ends up building a tax base and creating representation in, in really unfair ways at the edges, which it does with respect to the prison population. Technically, there simply is no solution to it because once you start moving people around, uh, then you have to do with every student. Do you count them in the state they came from, the state they're going to go back to uh, uh, when they're finished, and so forth and so on? The population is very, very mobile, and there really is no choice but to count people where there are. There are injustices embedded in that, and you're exactly right. It's a continuation of the old slave power um, uh, unfairness. I think we have time for one more question. Who would take the job as director of the Census Bureau under these conditions? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the the um, I, I I won't make a, give you a long answer to that. Um, but um, the politics of Census 2000 were very very intense and tough, and they were the politics of counting. They were basically the politics about sampling and who got counted and how we did that and so forth and so on. The Race and ethnic uh, advisory structure that was attached to the census was of one mind about the politics which were about counting. And differences of viewpoint about how to classify the people who were counted were muted, muted in that period. I now think the politics of counting is going to shift to a politics of classification. And the argument is going to get very, very tough. And it will not be fun uh, to be uh, uh, in, in, in the Census Bureau uh, with those. The, the, the older politics that sort of uh, uh, put all of the racial and ethnic uh, uh, groupings on one side with the big city mayors and so forth and so on um, against the suburbs and, and, and Republican areas uh, were going to be were much easier than what these, what these differences will be. I also think, and I'll conclude with this, I think it's extremely important for the American side to have this conversation. I ask yourself the question, why do we measure by race and ethnicity? And if the argument is to express identity, it's one answer. If the argument is to enforce discrimination, it's a different answer. Uh, if the argument is to sort of measure as much diversity as we can possibly measure, it takes you someplace else. And if the answer, as the California uh, Ward Connolly uh, people are saying, is we shouldn't do it at all, just one other footnote. The member of Congress who was most active on behalf of the multi-race item was Congressman Gingrich. He saw it coming. He knew that if you proliferated the categories, it's harder to do race-based social policy. Uh, and so I think the stakes are extremely high. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I personally think that, that there is still discrimination in this society, serious discrimination, and that it can build with the new immigrant populations that are coming in, and that we unfortunately need a system that can find it, detect it, and try to, to um, uh, work against it. Uh, and and that, that statistical proportionality, who is underrepresented, is one of the vehicles for doing that. And the absence of that tool, that administrative and legal tool, is going to make it very, very difficult. But if we proliferate the categories, I can tell you it won't work. Before you all leave, thank you so much, uh, Kenneth Pruitt, for a wonderful talk. I just want to, there are two things. One, I want to thank some of the people who made this event possible. Um, 
Dean Stan Altman, uh, Ernest Rodriguez Nas, I don't know if he's around, uh, Wendy Newfeld, a new name, Hood Newfeld, and um, Aisha Khan. And the second thing is I want to tell you that there's a reception with a lot of food in the next room, so you go this way or that way. <laughs> and so thank you very much for coming. <laughs>